morning. Good morning. Good morning, church. If you are in the gathering area, I'm going to invite you to come join us. Grab your cookies, grab your coffee, and we're going to get started. So my name is Kayla Kennedy. My husband and I are the youth leaders here. If you haven't figured it out yet, it is Revolution Youth Takeover, meaning the youth are taking over every single aspect of the church that they can. So there was youth that greeted you, handed you bulletins up here on worship, and I'm going to pull a few of them up here for the message this morning. Um, but what we've been going through the past few months with youth is we've been going through a little testimony series. So what we've been doing is inviting people, mostly from the church, to come into youth and share their testimonies. And I encourage them to pray about what they were to share, whether it was their journey to finding Jesus, a season God brought them out of, or maybe something they just struggled with when they were the kid's age. And I can say and speak for definitely all of us leaders and surely for all of our kids that we were blessed through this series. Every single week we look forward to who would be our next speaker and what they had to share with us. And before we go any further, I actually want to recognize those speakers um, who came in and took time out of their day to share. So if I say your name, please stand and remain standing until I am done. So we had Ken Bartlett, Barb Guile, Sean Mayo, Stephen Hand, Bob Morris, Deb Morris, Pastor Carl Linscott, obviously he's not here, Barb Scholl, Curtis Easton, Lauren Dowling, John Corcoran, Mike Schwenk, Nicole Mayo, Brett Kennedy, and Jenna Miller. Can we give them a round of applause? Yeah. Thank you all. You can go ahead and sit. Thank you so, so much for taking a Wednesday and coming spending it with our youth kids. It was so appreciated. And I also, we've been recognizing a lot of people this morning, I realize, but we're also gonna recognize our youth volunteers. So if I say your name, please stand. We have Lori Kennedy, Christina Olson, John Corcoran, Curtis Easton, and Sarah Martin, if you could please stand. And we have some youth kids to deliver cards to you. There they go. To deliver cards, perfect. And you also are so appreciated for taking your Wednesday time and time and time again to come and pour into these kids. You're not only pouring in to the church of the future, you're pouring into the church of the now, and this service is a testament to that. Um, but the questions that we would ask these kids after we would have a speaker share, we would ask them, what did you like about the way they presented their testimony? This was to help the students work on presenting their own testimonies. What did you learn about God, and how can you apply that to your life? So I'm going to invite a few of our youth to come up and share what they learned. I'm going to invite up Mackenzie, Alexander, Leslie Bowers, Landon Olson, Robbie Bowers, and Hannah. And I'm going to ask them three questions. Who are you sharing about? What did you learn about God? And how have you applied that to your life? You want to go first? All right, so who are you sharing about, Mackenzie? Ken Bartlett. And what did you learn about God? I learned that um, anything can be a gift from God, mm -hmm. no matter if how small or insignificant it seems, it can still be a gift. Yeah. And how have you applied that to your life any specific way? So in any circumstance, I've just started to take a step back and look at it in a way that I can see how God has helped me and will continue to help me. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Landon, you want to share? And who are you speaking about? Um, Sean Mayo. And what did you learn from his testimony? Give me a second. Give me a second. <laughs> um, God will provide for you in need. Yes, absolutely. And how have you applied that to your life? Mm -hmm. um, when someone needs help, I will um, give them help. Yeah. And, well, if they seem like they need help and they haven't asked for help, I'll ask for them. Yeah, them. be proactive. I love it. How about Leslie? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Leslie, go. <laughs> and Leslie, who are you sharing about? Um, Barb Guile. And what did you learn about God from her testimony? Uh, he likes to help us with even little things. Mm -hmm. And how have you applied that to your life? Uh, I've been like praying just come Holy Spirit, um, you know, when I'm just confused or, I don't know, need help with a little thing. Yeah, definitely. Praying, come Holy Spirit through all the things. How about Hannah? And who are you speaking about? Uh, Jenna Miller. 
And what did you learn about God from their testimony? I learned that even if there's nothing major going on in your life, he's still there if you just take a second to stop and look. Yeah, that's good. And how have you applied that to your life? Um, by always remembering every day to take some time to just spend time with God, whether it's reading my Bible, um, reading a pod, listening to a podcast, mm -hmm. or just praying. Yeah. It can always make me remember that he's there. Yeah, definitely. And Robbie? And Robbie, who are you sharing about? I'm um, talking about Sean Mayer. And he, he talked about like loving your neighbor as mm -hmm. yourself. Um, so one of his, the themes he mentioned was being a kind of a horseshoe in conversation. So instead of you and your group of friends being in a circle, then new people can't really come in. So just taking a step back, that leaves a gap that other people can come and and join in your conversation and your friendships. So that would be loving your neighbor as yourself mm -hmm. and like even the people you don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, and having an open mindset for new things. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> and you can take a seat. All right, now that you're sick and tired of clapping, we're gonna get to this message. So thank you to all of our youth kids. I know that is hard to come up here, but I loved this series. And one thing that I know we could take away from every single person's testimony was just how personal God is. That kept coming up in our discussion is, man, he is a personal God. He encounters us personally. So we each have our own unique testimony. So this morning we are going to share about the power of your testimony. Let's pray. Jesus, I just ask that you would come and move, God. God, silence our minds and focus us on you, Lord. God, I pray that any words that are mine and not yours, Lord, that they would be forgotten, that they won't even be said, God. God, I ask that you would open ears and open hearts and minds this morning, Lord. Let us learn a little bit more about our Savior, our Heavenly Father, Lord. We just welcome your presence, Lord, to move through the rest of the service, God. We love you and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you haven't figured it out yet, a testimony is just telling someone about your relationship with God. And I found a quote for you to dig a little deeper. A Christian testimony is given when Christians relate how we came to know the God of the Bible through the moving of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Most commonly, we are sharing how we became Christians by God's miraculous intervention and work in our lives through specific events. Often, we can only see that in hindsight, but sharing that experience is vital. Also, when giving this testimony, a sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ is always a necessity. The first point in your bulletin this morning is testimonies can help us overcome doubt and strengthen our faith. Our testimonies have power. Your testimony has power, and you have been called to share it. In Acts 1.8, Jesus is taken up into heaven, and before he ascends, he says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I believe one of the ways we are to witness is through our testimonies. Scripture doesn't say, oh, if you want to be a witness or, well, you should be a witness. It says once you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have received the Holy Spirit and you are to be a witness. We are to share the good news I can think of one specific lady in scripture who dropped literally everything and went to be a witness to share her testimony. I want to read John chapter 4, verses 28 to 30. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. So this is the story of the woman at the well, a woman who was once ashamed of her past and traveled in the heat of day to get her water. A woman who was once ashamed of her past and didn't speak of it. A woman who was once ashamed of her past and needing a savior. 
And the second she met Jesus, she was redeemed in Jesus' name. And it's important to note that Jesus didn't ignore her past. In fact, he actually calls it out in verses 17 to 18. He says, she, well, she says, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. It was her past that led her to the longing of her Savior. It was her past that led her to travel in the heat of day to the well to encounter Jesus. It was her scars. It was her brokenness that needed a healer, that needed the healer. And then we read, she was redeemed. She did not let the shame and guilt of her past stop her from sharing her testimony, and we should not let the shame and guilt of our past stop us from sharing our testimonies. The fact of the matter is that 99% of the time, our testimonies aren't very pretty. In fact, they're shared with rebellion, doubts, hurts, places we don't want to go back to, things you don't want to admit to, things you're not proud of, or that you don't want to relive. But church, if you are redeemed, you have a story to tell. You are a new creation. You are a child of God. You see, those seasons that the enemy puts you through that you felt like you were drowning in, those scars that just cut too deep, those people that brought you down, the things that the enemy tried to use to steal, kill, and destroy you, Jesus is turning those seasons around to bring glory to him. He wants to bring you out of those dark seasons so that you can speak light and life into others. Another person who came to mind as I was going through this sermon is Joseph. Joseph, the king of dreams. He didn't always feel like a king. Joseph was betrayed by his family. He was thrown into a pit. He was sold into slavery. He was accused wrongfully. He was tossed into prison. Joseph was a man who could have easily turned from God, who could have easily hated his brothers, who could have easily hurt others because of his own hurt. Joseph was a man that when put in a place of power could have easily abused it for revenge. But instead, he used it to bring glory to God. In Genesis 50, verses 20 to 21, Joseph encounters his brothers, the one that betrayed him, threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery, and after many years of pain initiated by them, he says this. His brothers went, then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. That song that we sang earlier, See a Victory, the lyrics say, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Joseph had hurt after hurt. He had scar after scar. He could have used any one of those scars as motivation to hurt others. But instead... He used those scars as motivation to bless others, to bring glory to God. I was listening to a sermon this week by Matt Chandler, and he said this, the story of the Bible isn't that there won't be a mess. It's that there will be a mess, but God will be with you in it. Joseph life, Joseph's life is certainly evidence of that, and I can promise you that my life is certainly evidence evidence of that. So we can sum up that quote with, suffering is normal and Jesus is good. You see, it's our suffering that creates our scars and our scars that create our testimonies. In Genesis 3.15, God is speaking to the serpent and says, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. It's the heel which has been wounded that's the only thing we can use to crush the serpent. It is our scars that will crush the enemy. The devil wants you to be quiet on how far you've come, on what you've done, and what you're going through. Because the devil knows there is power in your testimony. He knows that the very thing he used to bruise you, 
has the potential to be the very thing you can use to bruise him. Satan thought he was victorious by Jesus' death. But wasn't death the first part of resurrection? It was necessary to, for Jesus to die, for him to be raised from the dead. Jesus, like us, has scars. Our Lord, in his human nature, he was bruised, betrayed, bound, accused, whipped, scourged, spit upon, and nailed to the cross, where he was hung there in thirst, fever, darkness, and desertion. Jesus had scars. Jesus suffered. Let's read John chapter 20, verses 24 to 28. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas needed to see the scars. What did Jesus use as evidence to Thomas? He used the scars. Does anyone know what Jesus is in American Sign Language? Mom, she taught me Jesus loves me. This is Jesus in sign language. It's pointing to his scars. It was Jesus' death on the cross that saved you and me. It's his scars that are a testimony to his love, his sacrifice, his resurrection, and ultimately, his victory. Our scars tell a story. Jesus' scars tell the greatest love story ever written. A guy who loved you so much, he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for you. And like I said earlier, it was a brutal death. And he died to save you and me from our sins. Another thing about scars, you can't debate them. People will try all day long to debate the Bible, to debate specific scriptures. But they can't debate your scars. They cannot debate your experience. In John chapter 9, a man says, I was blind, but now I see. The Pharisees couldn't debate that. They tried, actually, multiple times. You can't debate someone's experience. I remember when I first started speaking up here and Pastor Brett said to me, hey, when you're giving a testimony, when you're telling little bits and pieces of your life, step away from your notes. That's the one part you definitely can't mess up. That's your story. That's your testimony. There's lots in the Bible. It's a pretty big book. Like I said earlier, it's the greatest love story ever written. It's also really messy and oftentimes pretty ugly. There's lots to study. I used to be so overwhelmed. There's so much to learn, so much to gain. Would I ever know enough to get up here and share about the gospel message or to share it with anyone? We have Matthew, we have Mark, Luke, and John that all talk about the ministry of Jesus. We also have Kayla and Dan and Brett and Stephen and Nicole and Sean. What about those accounts? The accounts of Jesus ministering to me, the accounts of Jesus ministering to you, you can't mess up your story. There's one gospel story you can't mess up and that's what God has done in your life. Don't know how to talk about the Bible? Talk about your testimony. Talk about your scars. Your relationship with Jesus is what will lead them to him. The woman at the well that we talked about earlier, she led many to believe. But if you look back at scripture, they come back to her. And they say, we no longer believe just from your testimony. We believe because we have encountered him ourselves. That's the goal. Use your testimony to point to the one true king. 
When you share your testimony, there is no pressure. And also, you don't need to embellish it. Jesus is pretty cool on his own. Your testimony doesn't need to do the saving. Jesus is the one who gets to do the saving. It's your job to open up, be vulnerable, share your scars. They will point to Jesus, and he will take care of the rest. The Chosen quotes, um, we share this quote a lot. I love this quote. It says, I was one way, now I'm another. The thing that happened in between was him. I want to close with a testimony that we all are a part of. Pastor Brett's life. We have a slide with a picture. So we can see God's faithfulness. And Pastor Brett, in one of his lowest moments, he could have let the enemy steal, kill, and destroy him. He could have given in, but instead he chose life and life to the full, not just for him, but for his family. And I wish I could hold up a mirror because that decision also affects every single one of you. You are a part of his testimony. That dash is actually a cross. If we go to the next slide. Oh, there's scripture. It's in there somewhere. But that dash is actually a cross, and it marks the day of salvation. When you accepted him, when you were changed, you can visibly see what that can lead to. We see these signs all the time, all because two people fell in love. What about all because of God's faithfulness? Every single one of us in this room gets to be a part of that, to that testimony, and you have a testimony yourselves. If Jesus has saved you, you have a story. I was one way, now I'm another, and he is what happened in between. You may be sitting here thinking, I have nothing to share. My testimony is pretty boring. I don't think I need to open up to anyone about it. Well, consider your relationship with God. Having a relationship with the creator of the universe is a testimony in itself. And parents, tell your kids. It is so powerful to hear testimonies from people you know, people you don't know. Man, it is powerful when you hear a testimony from the people who raised you. And a challenge for you. Take it a step further. Write your testimonies down. Judges 2.10 says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Don't you want your children and their children and their children and their children and their children to read about God's faithfulness to their ancestors? Writing testimonies is one way to leave a legacy that testifies God's love and goodness and reminds your family that there is a miracle working God who exists. It would make it difficult for them to be deceived into thinking miracles no longer happen. They would see reasons to serve your God, to trust him, to make him their God, and seek God for themselves. So tell your kids, tell your family. I promise you they will have a newfound respect for you when they hear about your faith in action. God wants to use your frustration. He wants to use your anger, your seasons of grieving, your seasons of brokenness. He wants to use your scars to shine his light into darkness. He wants to use you. You know what your testimony says? If he's done it before, he'll do it again. It says, if when I was lost, he found me, he'll leave the 99 to come and find you. It says, he broke my chains, and I know he'll break yours too. It says, if he saved me, he has come to save you. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you that when the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Lord, that you have come so that we may have life and have it to the full, God. We thank you that you are working in each one of us, God. God, as we move into ministry time, and as every head is bowed and every eye closed, Lord, I can't help but to think of the blind man who after the second time of sharing his testimony 
He says, I was blind, but now I see. He asks the question, do you want to be his disciples too? So church this morning, from a fellow daughter of God, from someone who was lost but is found, from someone who was broken but has been redeemed, from someone who was blind but now I see, as every head is bowed and eyes are closed, I ask you that, this question this morning, church. Do you want to be a disciple too? I'm going to lead you through a prayer of salvation. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, to reign in your heart, to be your Lord and Savior, you can do that right now. God, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. Thank you for sending your one and only son to die on the cross for me. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to be set free, and I want to share your good news. So as every head is bowed, every eye is closed, if you just prayed that prayer, I ask you to just raise your hand in boldness. I want you to know that Jesus sees you. I want you to know that I see you, and man, I'm going to be praying for you. You can go ahead and put your, your hand down. Jesus, I just ask you would come and move, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Um, one more thing I wanted to share is, um, man, I get so emotional when people pray that prayer. Can I tell you multiple people have been raising their hands? That means God's moving. It means that people are here who are looking for a savior, and God gets to use us to lead them to that. It is an honor, and it is a privilege to be a part of that. But one more thing I want to share as the worship team begins to play. I believe this morning that as we go into ministry time, there are people here with a wound that's a little too fresh. There's a wound, and it's not healed yet. There's a testimony that's still loading, it's still in progress. God wants to heal that wound this morning. He wants to break those chains off of you. He wants to turn your wound into a healed scar. He wants to turn your trials into a testimony. The devil may be crippling you, but you are going to come out of the season living and breathing. The season that is drowning you will be a season that brings him more glory than you can even imagine. Bring you more freedom than you have ever felt. And God wants to bring you out of that season today. So I'll welcome um, the ministry team to step out to the side. And as our worship team um, plays, if you have a wound that, man, you want God to heal, it's really been bringing you down, I'd encourage you to get prayer for that this morning.